this is our online campus and we are about to start our online service. We're so happy that you're here. We hope you've come ready to worship. I don't know, maybe you've had a, a tough week. Maybe you've had a great week, but whatever has happened in your week, we want you to know that we believe that God is about to reach out to you through this worship service. You know what's amazing about God is whenever we open ourselves up to him, he meets us where we're at. But whenever we start to get a little bit closed, it becomes hard for God to reach out to us. So start to open up for whatever God's going to do. And let me tell you a little bit about our online community. We love it when you interact with one another. If you have any questions, you can talk to our online host. If you'd like to give, there's a link right above the video that you can click on, you'll be able to give. And that way, if you have prayer requests, you can send a prayer through email at prayer at mychristchurch.com. And we love it, love it, love it when you share these videos because when you share them, I wanna tell you something. Your friends on Facebook, they are watching these videos. It's encouraging them. How do we know that? Because we actually hear from them. So make sure you share this video. But worship is about to start. Again, we're glad you're joining us. We can't wait to see what God's going to do through this worship service in your life. Let's worship. Shining 
worship by greeting one another this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Christ Church. My name is Reverend Mike. We are so glad that we are worshiping with you this morning. If you're joining us online, we're grateful to have you here. May God bless you. Take time to share this service so other people can hear about Jesus. Now, speaking of sharing, this is a time of year where we share a whole lot with you. So make sure you buckle your safety belts. Here we go. Tonight, we have a horse trough Sunday worship service. It's going to be here at the six, during the 6 o'clock service. We are so excited about that. See, the Holy Spirit move. If you've never been baptized before, this is your opportunity to profess your faith in Jesus. That's the 6 o'clock service. We are going to have a 4 o'clock class about what's going to happen tonight. We can answer your questions about baptism and we'll tell you about baptism as well. That class is at four o'clock this afternoon and that will be in here. So horse trough service tonight. Next Sunday, November 24th, we have orientation and new membership class. It's going to be in the chapel. It starts at four. At four o'clock, we'll have orientation. That's when you hear about our mission. That's when you hear about our standard and our strategy here at Christ Church. It's when you learn about us. And if you feel so loved, we'd love to have you a part of the Christ Church family. That's at the new membership class at 5 o'clock, again, next Sunday in the chapel. Next, we have the Christ Church Bookstore. Noel and her crew has been working so hard on making the store look great. And let me tell you, the bookstore looks absolutely fabulous right back there by the coffee cafe. Go there. It's a great place to buy gifts for other people. It's a great way to support the ministry of Christ Church. Now, a few weeks back, we had a special walkout offering for the Christian Activity Center. Now, the Christian Activity Center actually talked to us. Reverend Shane was there, and they said that they had a couple needs for kids. And one of the big needs that they had is that there was kiddos not participating in PE and physical education because they didn't have something as simple as underwear. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to do a walkout offering so that need and a few other needs will be provided for. Whenever we do a walkout offering, there's a few things, kind of rules we have and how it goes is that no family can give more than $5. We, of course, sp uh, pick a specific need, and it's a way we can kind of have a thumbprint on it with that low uh, $5 giving per family. Pleased to let you know we collected $1,765.15. Let's give God some praise for that. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We got that check to the CAC. And speaking of special offerings, in a few weeks, we'll do one of the traditions we've had around Christ Church for a, several years, and that's the Christ Church Christmas offering. We have some really exciting things we're gonna give uh, towards to connect people with Jesus this year. You've got an email about that this week if you're in the uh, system. We'll talk more about that in the coming weeks, but I want you to know right now, that December 15th will be the day that we collect that offering. If you're joining us online, text to give will be an option for you. Valerie, our host right now, can tell you about that, but that will be December 15th in the uh, coming weeks. All right, Do I, uh, man, there's a lot today. All right, finally, finally. In January, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes are gonna have an amazing event here. Rick Horton wants to tell you more. Take a look. Hey, Christ Church, this is Rick Horton. Really want to thank you for your great partnership with FCA over the years. We're going to have a terrific event at the church on the 23rd of January. Isaac Bruce will be here and we'll be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the greatest show on turf, the Super Bowl championship. And we're also going to raise some funds for the FCA in the Metro East. Randy Carricker from 101 ESPN Radio will be our host and Christ Church attenders will get a special opportunity for a pre-sale ticket and that'll be on November 18th at 10 a.m. Go to mychristchurch.com to get the pre-sale link. Don't miss this chance to celebrate the 20th anniversary Super Bowl championship with Isaac Bruce and Randy Carricker and also to raise funds for the Metro East FCA. 
Amen. Looking forward to that event. Unbuckle your safety belt. Let's prepare to collect God's tithes and our offerings. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you so much, God. We thank you so much that we get to be a part of what you're doing here and all the incredible things that you're using us for. God, we give you honor. Bless the gift, God. Bless the giver that more and more people might be connected with your son, Jesus. We pray this through his name. Amen. Ushers, you may serve God's people.
The scripture reading today comes from Psalm 124. What if the Lord had not been on our side? Let all Israel repeat. What if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us? They would have swallowed us up alive in their burning anger. The waters would have engulfed us. A torrent would have overwhelmed us. Yes, the raging waters of their fury would have overwhelmed our very lives. But praise the Lord, who did not let their teeth tear us apart. We escaped like a bird from a hunter's trap. The trap is broken and we are free. Our help is from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God and you may be seated. Don Frazier. I'm the worship pastor here at Christ Church. And when I think of worship, I always remember that it is about my response to what God has already done. I don't worship because it's something that I do out of my own interests. It's because what God has done for me and it is my response because it, it compels me to worship Him. And so when we get together as a church, we are compelled corporately as the body of Christ to respond to His saving work that He has already done for us. And that's what compels us to worship. It's not of our own desire specifically to come into this place and gather together. We come because God calls us to respond to him. And when we worship together in, in any space as the group, as the congregation, as the church, something supernatural happens. And no, not supernatural like, you know, ghosts and weird things that go bump in the night. No, supernatural in the fact that our God is awesome. And because we can come before him in an act of worship and his Holy Spirit is present, we have this opportunity to experience our God in a way that's more profound than we could, than I know I could ever put into words. So if I could say what I would want our church to most know about worship, it's that I see it as a, as a rehearsal for what we're going to do in eternity. Worship peels back the veil of eternity between now and what is to come. And we get to glimpse that when we truly embrace and participate in worship. God is good all the time. It sure is good to see you. I, I told someone this morning, I'm not at all sure if you miss me when I'm gone, but man, do I miss you guys, and I, I'm so glad to be back with you today. Today we continue, Ascend, Cultivating a Heart for God. This grouping of Psalms ranges from Psalm 120 to 134, and they are the lyrics to songs that pilgrims sang as they went up to Jerusalem to worship, to celebrate feasts, and to celebrate holy days in antiquity. They are songs of worship, and they denote specific components of worship. And today we're going to look at one very specific component, thanksgiving for deliverance. Now we often think of giving thanks as looking backward. For example, thanksgiving we celebrate the pilgrims, right? We celebrate that first Thanksgiving. And how do we do that? 
by dumping gelatinous cranberry sauce out of cans right into a plate. And we slice that up and we say, thank you, pilgrims, we have cranberry sauce. But there's this different kind of dynamic to worship when it comes to thanksgiving for deliverance. It it looks back, (coughs) to be sure, it celebrates God's deliverance in the past, but there's also a forward aspect to it. Uh, Certainly we thank God for deliverance yesterday, deliverance today, but prayers for deliverance in the context of worship are also anticipatory in nature. Thanksgiving as a form of worship always has this this piece of anticipation baked into it. You see, even in the worst of circumstances, we can thank God for the deliverance that is already on its way. Even in the worst of times, we can thank God for deliverance that has not arrived, but is on its way. As we near Thanksgiving, I cannot imagine a more appropriate psalm. So I want to throw a single idea in front of you. God is our present. I'm sorry. God is our past, present, and future deliverer. Say that with me. God is our past, present, and future deliverer. When we worship God, we are in the very process of being delivered. God literally is in the process of setting us free as we praise God, I hope that you came here to worship today. Those of you that are joining us on Facebook Live, those of you that that join us online, I hope you do so because you want to worship today. Let's look at five components of worship, and then let's dive in. Number one, worship. You always come as you are. God receives us as we are. Number two, our focus in worship is on God. So the idea is to get our focus off of everything but God. Number three, we need to engage. We need to lean in, not out. Worship is not a spectator sport. It's a participatory sport. You didn't come today to watch. You came to play. Number four, we need to encounter God. If you come to worship and fail to encounter God, you have missed an incredible opportunity. And number five, you leave changed. I want to suggest to you it is mathematically impossible to encounter God and remain the way you were before. It's impossible. Let's take a look at Christ, at God as our deliverer. A deliverer is a person who rescues you from harm or danger. In the Bible, a deliverer is a type of hero. Deliverers save the day. A deliverer rescues us from danger, escorts us from a bad place to a good place. Abraham delivered into a world that had forgotten God, a chosen people. Moses delivered the Hebrews from Egyptian slavery. The judges were a series of deliverers who who led the tribes of Israel from oppression to peace. Nehemiah was a deliverer who began the process of leading Israel from exile back to Jerusalem. And Jesus is a deliverer who led humanity from sin and death into forgiveness and eternal life. But I've got to be real straight with you here. Jesus doesn't just deliver from 30,000 feet. He also delivered the sick and the diseased and the troubled and the tormented. He didn't just deliver all of us. He delivered specific people into wholeness. You see, Jesus delivers in the air and Jesus delivers on the ground. That is the thing about God. God doesn't just care for the whole world. God cares for you. And God doesn't just care about what's going on in the whole world. God cares about what's going on in your life. The one who made the stars and the ocean can also heal your troubled mind and your diseased (coughs) body (coughs) and your desperate soul. Verses two and three. If the Lord had not been on our side when the people rose up against us, they would have swallowed us alive because of their burning anger. The opening of this psalm, the psalms were written in Hebrew. The, The connotations around the word swallowed up literally denotes a sea monster. 
This is a psalm of David, who was the king of Israel. And during his reign, and during his entire era, the chief nemesis of his people were the seafaring Philistines, who occupied the Mediterranean coast west of Israel. David's military career probably began as a young teenager when he killed a Philistine by the name of Goliath of Gath. David fought Philistines his whole life. Not only did he have external enemies to his west, he had internal enemies right under his own roof. Absalom, David's son, smart and good-looking, orchestrated a coup d'etat against his father, and for a season drove David from the city of David. David had trouble, trouble controlling his general Joab. Wildfires constantly ignited around his monarchy. Dysfunction raged within his family. There was always drama in the house of David. The monster was always at his doorstep. Sometimes from outside forces, sometimes from inside forces, sometimes from David himself. But God delivered David, not just once, God delivered David again and again and again. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Is there anybody here who God has delivered again and again and again? Some of you have had hard lives. You felt the breath of the monster on the back of your neck. You felt him gaining on you. You thought he had you. But for whatever reason, you were not consumed. Scarred, perhaps, maybe even damaged, but you weren't consumed. You somehow survived when a lot of people around you did not survive. Many of you, if you had to be real honest, cannot believe you are still alive. You ever see those interviews with old rock stars? They're all like 75 now. And they all look in the camera and say, I just can't believe I'm still alive. <laughs> Some of you are in church. And church is truly the last place you thought you'd ever be. And you know people who would not believe it if they heard you were in church right now. Some of you have words of thanks that need to be offered to God. And you've really not told them. Some of you have powerful testimonies that are just waiting to be told. Has the Lord delivered you from the monster? Has the Lord delivered you again and again and again? Then give thanks to him again and again and again. Because God will never get tired of delivering you, and God will never get tired of hearing your praise. Verse 5, yes, the raging waters of their fury would have overwhelmed our very lives. The area around Jerusalem is desolate, but if you push down into the Dead Sea, it's, it's even worse. The Dead Sea area is, is just, there's just no moisture. And there's this huge body <coughs> of water called the Dead Sea that is so salty when you get in it, you almost just sit on top of it. Nothing lives in the Dead Sea. It, it's desolate. When you look at the terrain, it, it looks like it was cut by ancient rivers that are now just beds of sand. And parched at that. But every now and then, even in Israel, it rains. And when it rains, it rains hard. When the rain comes down in torrents, there's no real soil to absorb it. There's no veg vegetation to drink it up. And rain just really quickly turns into floods. And in a blink, a dry wadi can become a, a destructive, raging river. Jesus pointed to this reality in a parable about two houses in Matthew 7. Do you remember? One's built on rock, one's built on sand. When the storm and the floods come, only the house built on rock remains standing. In a fallen world, the question is not whether the floods will hit. They will. The question is whether your house will remain standing. Some of you are in flood waters right now. Some of you are just hanging on with white Knuckles, Maybe church is what you're hanging on to today. But if you let go for even a minute, the flood would just wash you away. Some of you have gone to the doctor and returned home with news that has changed your life. Flood. Some of you have lost your jobs 
and been thrown into a desperate financial situation. Flood. Some of you have marriages and families that are literally blowing apart. Flood. Some of you have lost loved ones to unexpected death. And some of of you have experienced more tragedy than a human should experience in 10 lifetimes. Flood. Some of you have lived in the grip of addiction for years, and just when you think you've broken free, it drags you right back under the waters. Flood. But here you are. You ain't dead yet. You may be waterlogged. You may be gurgling. But you're not dead. You didn't drown, did you? Has the Lord delivered you from the flood? Has the Lord delivered you again and again? Then let us thank the Lord again and again. Verse 6, blessed be the Lord who did not let their teeth tear us apart. For those seeking to climb God's mountain in antiquity, there were always predators around. In fact, predators were everywhere. In Bible times, we know from the Bible and from history that there were lions and bears and wolves and even crocodiles in Israel and they all had to eat. There were always bandits who made their living by the robbery of isolated or weak travelers. Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10 reflects this reality. If you're going to travel to God's holy mountain, it, it meant risking attacks from both human and animal predators. We know what it's like to live in a world of predators, don't we? There are disenfranchised predators who are driven by poverty and addictions. And there are enfranchised predators who are driven by lust and greed. There are reckless predators who become drunk and then become weapons by driving a vehicle. And there are ruthless predators who sell drugs to kids because they like the money and the lifestyle. There are predators who drive by our homes looking for unattended children, and there are heavily armed predators looking to kill simply because they can. There are predators who infuse godless values to our teens through the media for the purpose of selling them things. And predators who assume our identities and try to steal our money. Some of you have been attacked by those predators. Some of you have scars from the teeth of those predators. Some of you may have even open wounds from those predators, but they didn't kill you, did they? Has God delivered you from the predator over and over and over again? Then thank him over and over and over again. Verse 7, we escaped like a bird from the hunter's trap. I like the King James. My soul escaped like a bird out of the f- snare of the fowler. In David's day, birds actually had monetary value. Uh, live birds. You used birds for two things. In a culture that had very little access to meat, uh, <coughs> a bird was a, a lunch. You get a bird, cook a bird, it's lunch. They also sacrifice birds. People that didn't have a lot of money could go (laughs) and sacrifice birds at the temple. Birds had monetary value. We don't get that, right? I've never heard one person in my whole life say to me, I'm strapped on cash, I'm going to go trap a bird. Nobody says that now. But back in those days, it happened all of the time. But a bird was only valuable if it was alive. Once dead, that bird had a very short shelf life. You know what you need to trap a bird? A skilled trapper? A careless bird? A trap? And bait. Satan traps people all the time. You want to know what he needs? A careless human? Satan is a skilled trapper. A good trap. And bait. Satan has a lot of people trapped today a young person starts smoking or vaping 
begins a habit that will systemically destroy the respiratory system over the next 50 years. Trapped. A teenager binge drinks on the weekend and develops a physical addiction to alcohol that will plunge her into a life of alcoholism. Trapped. A young couple just keeps charging as long as companies will issue them cards. And now they owe more money than they will make combined in three years. And the arguments only intensify. Trapped. A lonely person surfs the internet and is lured into dark places where sexual perversion reaches from the monitor. Trapped. A woman's on a business trip thinking about her lousy marriage and goes to the bar to get a couple drinks. She meets a sweet talking regular. Trapped. A retired couple goes to the casino for a night on the town. And they develop a habit that in two years will absolutely exhaust every cent they have saved over their lifetime. Trapped. A young person peruses the internet and decides if he can't be rich and beautiful and brilliant or talented, there's really no point in living. Trapped. And yet the verse goes on. It says the trap is broken and we are set free. For some of you, Jesus not only delivered you, but Jesus did something more. He broke the trap. My friends, it's one thing to have Jesus deliver you from the snare. It's something else to say, Jesus, thank you for delivering me. Would you mind just crushing that trap underneath your feet? Because I can't seem to stay out of it. trap is broken and we are set free I want you to hear this if God has delivered you from your enemy if God has delivered you from the floods if God has delivered you from the teeth of the predator if God has delivered you from the trap you must be of great value God must have an incredible plan for you because why would God go to all that trouble to save a nobody why would God go to all that trouble to save somebody that doesn't matter you matter and if you want proof Jesus died for you and Jesus will set you free you matter and if God went all to all that trouble to deliver you and if God has a plan for you give him thanks and give him praise. Verse 8. <clears throat> Our help is from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. It's okay if I get real? Some of you are trapped right now. You're trapped right now. And maybe part of the reason you're here today is because you'd really love to be delivered before it destroys everything around you then I want to suggest that you give God thanks for your deliverance that is still to come. Start thanking God for the deliverance that is already on its way. Because I have good news for you. The God who created the heavens and the earth wants to set you free today. Are you ready to let Jesus not only set you free, are you ready to let him crush the trap that ensnares you? But don't answer too quickly. A lot of people really like their traps. They've grown accustomed to living in their traps. About 20 years ago, I asked our associate pastor, Ralph Philippi, to preach for me one Sunday morning when I was gone. We were in the old sanctuary, which is the chapel now, and I was away. Ralph was preaching a sermon on deliverance. And when he was preaching this sermon i mean ralph could get at it a little bit how many of you remember ralph ralph could get at it a little bit and on this particular day he was preaching about being delivered from cigarettes he was preaching about being delivered from cigarettes you see ralph couldn't understand because when god got a hold of ralph ralph was instantly set free 
from all his bad habits. I mean, God delivered him, God crushed the trap, and for the life of Ralph, he couldn't understand why everybody wasn't instantly set free. So he was pounding pretty hard on camel cigarettes and the good farmers in North Carolina that morning. And finally, he's really kind of into it. And if you knew Ralph, it was right when his ears started to get purple, that, that's when it was going good. And while Ralph was preaching against cigarettes, there was a man in the front pew, maybe about three back, and he couldn't stand it anymore. And he grabs a pack of cigarettes out of his front pocket and he starts waving them. And he was a tall guy. He starts waving them at Ralph and then he just walked right out of the church. And my phone started ringing. <laughs> you will not believe what Ralph did today. Well, I went and had lunch and after lunch I gave Ralph a call. I said, Ralph, can I not even be gone one Sunday without you starting a riot? He just laughed. I said, seriously, Ralph, when the guy walked out, what were you thinking? Ralph thought for just a second. And he said, I was thinking this. I wanted to tell him the altar was the other direction. That's really our problem, isn't it? That's really our problem, isn't it? We see the monster and we just want to run. We see the addictions in our lives and we just want to run. We feel everything crumbling around us and we just want to run. We see the flood and we're caught in it and we just want to run. We see the predator and we feel their teeth inside of our skin and we just want to run. But the problem is the altar is the other direction. There is no help in running. Remember the old rock and roll song, you can't run away forever, but there's nothing wrong with getting a good head start. Wrong. You just can't outrun this thing. You can't outrun it. The altar's the other direction. I want to close with a straight up old fashioned altar call. First of all, if God has delivered you again and again and again, if God is your deliverer, if you know God as a deliverer, I want to encourage you just to come to the front during the song immediately after my message and thank God for delivering you. You say, well, I can do that in my seat. Sure you can, but that's not what I'm asking you to do. God delivered you in time and space. Why don't you come and give thanks to God in time and space? Sometimes there's nothing wrong with telling somebody thank you in a very formal and humble way, and this is an opportunity to do that. Have you ever really done that? Just come and thank God for his deliverance. Secondly, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you've never asked Christ into your heart, I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. Good heavens, you can come and get baptized tonight. All you got to say is, Jesus, I've made a mess of my life. Would you forgive me of my sin, and would you come into my life and make me a Christian? My friends, there's not this magic formula. There's just a heart that cries for forgiveness and invites Christ to be in the midst of it. But some of you are still in the trap and you just need delivered. That's just all there is. You need God to do a miracle in your life because if you could get out of the trap, you already would have. And I'm gonna have some people up here and they're just gonna <coughs> pray with you for your deliverance. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to the doctor. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to the counselor. I'm not saying you shouldn't do anything. But I am saying this. You shouldn't do any of that until you ask God to deliver you first. And I'm going to have some people up here. So here's how it's going to work. If you want to give God thanks, you just come up, find a spot up here somewhere, and give God thanks. If you can't kneel, just stand. It's getting harder for me to kneel every year. I get it. Just stand. If you want to ask Jesus into your life, you can either come and do that here or you can stop and one of the people up front would love to pray with you to ask Jesus in. And if you need delivered, I'm going to ask you to come and just pray with one of the people up front because we asked people to come up front 
who believe that God can actually deliver folks. If I'm sick, I want somebody praying for me that believes God can actually heal me. Can I hear an amen from somebody? I don't need some half-hearted prayer. I need somebody that's going to lean into this and get down in it with me. And I believe that God is not only our deliverer, I believe that God will crush the trap. But the altar's the other direction. Stop running. Turn around. Christ is waiting. Your life can change today. And it can start right now. I'm going to ask the prayer people to come on up. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks for your deliverance. We give you thanks that you not only set us free, but you break the trap, you crush the cage. Thank you, dear God, that the trap is broken and that we're set free. Dear God, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, maybe they've been in church their whole life, but they've never asked you to come into their lives. They've never said, Lord, forgive me and fill me with the presence of Jesus. I want to be a Christian, and I want it to start right now. Dear God, whether they're home, at home watching on Facebook or on the internet, whether they're here, I pray that you would just give them the strength to say, Jesus, come into my life. Make me a Christian. I want a new life, and I want it to start right now. For those who may still be trapped, I prophesy in the name of Jesus that they will be set free. I prophesy in the name of Jesus that the trap will be crushed under the heel of our Savior and Lord. Thank you, dear God, for what you came to do. And forgive us that we try so hard to do it on our own when all the power in the cosmos is waiting right in front of us. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna invite you to stand. I'm gonna invite you to respond as God leads you.
Don't you know he's always bad? He's always bad. So why my soul are you downcast? Tell me why my heart are you so sad? Don't you know your God is on your side? Don't you know he's always a brighter day beyond the clouds A hope for all who choose the cross For Jesus is brighter than the darkest night Jesus is higher than the lowest thought Oh, Jesus is brighter the darkest of nights Oh, Jesus is higher than the lowest of thoughts If there is calm in the arms of our Father And He has grace for today and the days that follow and There's no shame or contempt for those who call upon His name the name of Jesus. We sing His name, start to see the shadows running. And above all, He reigns and His word is final. And there's no shame or contempt for all who call upon His name. The name of the name of Jesus.
sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me come on let's sing this is it then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim thank you for your presence here. God, we thank you that where you are, there is light. In your presence, there is freedom. And God, we claim that freedom in Jesus' name. And God, as we leave this place, you are with us wherever we go. And so God, as we leave, I pray that you show us and teach us what it really means to be free in your name in our daily lives. Thank you for meeting us where we're at continually. God, we give you the praise and the glory. In your name, amen. It was so good to see all of you. Have a great week. We will see you next Sunday. Go in peace.